19 to 92. The Jerry Ryan Show, Monday to Friday, 9 till 12 on 2FM. Now, Richie Hewitt, good morning and welcome. Hi, Jolly. How are you? I'm well, Richie. How are you? Uh, hanging in down now. Now, Richie, you've been, uh, you've been visited and your partner, Laura, and your five-year-old son, Kyle. You yeah. moved into a council house in Holy Hill, or Holly Hill, should I say, in Cork last August. In fact, it's not holy at all. Sure, it's not. No. Um, as you said, there's already been moved in um, last August, and uh, we, there was a lot of work. A lot of work we had to be do to the house. And um, as, I, as I was saying to people, like, this started off very small. Like, um, there was keys just going missing at the start. There would be uh, an ashtray going missing. A few bits of clothing would go kind of missing, you know. So it really it got heavy. Like, we didn't take that much notice of it. Like, at the start, like, no cupboards, just open now. And we come down and I close them. All of, uh, there was a day I went into the kitchen and the cooker was turned on. And I went out to Laura and I said, um, why didn't you turn off the cooker, like, after you use And she'd say, I didn't turn it on. Like, dog, like, Jerry, we had fierce fights over this, like, you know, things... So we you'd, uh, you'd come in and you go, who the hell left the cooker on? Yeah. Say, I didn't. You must have. It didn't go on by itself. Yeah, and just, uh, as uh, we used to say, like, because one day, you know, the, the kitchen sink filled up with water and overflowed. The stopper was in it and all, and I went out to Laura, and I said, what the hell are you doing inside the kitchen, even the water overflow? And she said, I didn't. And the thing I used to say, who done it so? The ghost of it? You know, not natural reaction, like. Yeah, sure. Do you know, and um, it got it started getting very serious then because one night uh, Laura put Kyle to bed, and she came down, and um, we were watching the telly, and we heard a, a thump from upstairs. So our natural reaction to us ran up the stairs, and Kyle was over the other side of his bed, over the, out of the bed, now over the other side of the room. Yeah. And we and we asked like Kyle, what happened? And he said the man threw me out of the bed. The man threw me out of the bed. The man threw me out of the bed. And I says, what man? He goes, Richie, the man with the eyes. The man with the eyes. So I says, like, we were getting worried then. You know, but I was there. I, I, like, I looked around. I was, look, Kyle, there's no one here. There's, there's no man with the eyes. And yeah. so, and other night, he came running into us. He, had to, he closed the bedroom door and he was very upset. He was saying, the man is, the eyes is getting me, he's going to get me. And I said, look, Kyle, I goes, what does he look like? Yeah. And he goes, he looks like a robber. Right. So then we kind of left it go again, what, about four weeks ago then, it started getting very serious. Myself and Laura were in the kitchen around half past one in the morning and Laura walked into the front room because she was on the phone to her mother and I was walking out towards the sitting room and a glass flew from the counter. By itself? By itself. And it smashed off the wall. So Laura came in then and she asked what happened. And I go, to be honest, I said, I don't know. I said, the glass just busted off the wall, I said. And as we were standing by the double doors in the sitting room, the cupboard in the kitchen opened and everything started flying out. Over the cupboards, like, in front of the two of us. So the first thing we done then was... Like Laura's mother's only. So you're talking about the plates, everything flying out of the cupboards. Cups, glasses, plates, Plates, knives, forks, you name it. The whole lot. The whole lot. So we flying out by themselves. You could actually see them flying out by themselves. Oh yeah, you could see them actually coming out of the cupboard towards us, flying out. So as the first reaction, we got out of the house and went over to Laura's mother's house. So the following day, we went up to um, the local priest in the area, and we were explaining to him. So he said he'd come down and he'd do a blessing on the house. Yeah. So we were, myself, Laura, and Laura's mother were waiting in the sitting room for the priest to call. He called. As we were going into the kitchen, we had um, a holy a holy statue up in the windowsill in the kitchen. Yeah. As we, me, uh, Laura, and her mother and the priest walked into the kitchen, the statue was actually down in the centre of the floor. It flew off the wall? It, no, it was actually just, no, a statue standing on the windowsill. Oh, yeah. But uh, when we went in, it was actually down in the centre of the floor in the kitchen. So the priest, first reaction, he was baffled, like. Yeah, I'd say he was. You know, he, he just couldn't. 
So when the priest was actually standing there, then Jerry, he actually felt a presence in the room actually brushing off him. You know? So yeah. he said, it's, there's definitely a presence in this house, he said. So he blessed the house anyway, and he just said, look, I, I prefer none of you stayed here tonight. So we went over to um, Laura's mother's and stayed the night. So the following morning we came back. The table in the kitchen was over the other side of the kitchen. There was a, a kitchen chair in the sitting room by the, uh, the sitting room window, just as if someone was sitting down looking out. Mm. Uh, so we called him back again, like, and he came back again and he couldn't believe it. But he was on the phone, he was talking to, uh, I think it was the bishop of Cork there, last Bishop Buckley, I think, at the time. And he was upstairs, and we, there was a holy water fan screwed into the wall upstairs. And as he was talking on the phone, uh, that was turning in front of his eyes. Turning in front of his eyes? Yeah. My God. So, like, as he said himself, like, he couldn't believe it, like, you know? And there was another time then we were in the kitchen, me, uh, the priest, and one of the neighbours, and the light in the kitchen switched on. And there was no one, no one could have done it, Charlie, uh, because there was no one over by the switches. Yeah. You know? So, um... Are you getting any unusual smells or dro oh, we got drops in temperature smell. or anything like that? Oh, the temperatures dropped fierce in the house. The coldness, the, um, the smell, the smell, it was like dampness, water, you know? Yeah. But there was a few people then came up to the house to, and witnessed all this themselves. You know, like, as I said, like, we're saying to people, like, there's 11 letters after being sent into the Cork City Council from what people seen. There was pictures sent in because we caught pictures of orbs. You know? Oh, my God. But we actually have pictures of the orbs inside the house and... What do the orbs look like? Orbs, I suppose. Just orbs, like, you know, just the, the white balls. Like, what happened, Jerry, when things were moving... They take like they were taken from diff three different cameras, yeah. And the orbs, because just in case it was a lens or something, I'm on the cameras. But in every three different cameras, it was the same thing. Right. You know. Now I know my colleague Neil Prenderville from Corks ninety six FM helped you to get a shaman. Yeah, that's right. Um, Into the house on Friday. That's what they left Thursday. That's Thursday. Now, did that help? No, what the story is so far, like, Paul O'Halloran is his name, he came to the house, and before he even... The shaman, of course, is a, it's a holy man. Yeah, that's right, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Now, he, when he came down to us first in Cork, we actually, we had a cup of tea first before we went near the house, and he was picking up that he could feel a child in the house. So... Before he even got there. Before he even got there. And, Jerry, to be honest, though, I'm going to say the truth. Hmm. I was on the phone the night before to, to Paul himself, and he was able to describe the inside of my house, inside out. Without ever house. having seen it. Without ever having seen the house or been in the house. Oh, my God. And, curiosity's sake, when we went into the house, he was dead on. He was, everything he said to me the night before was in the exact spot he said. You know? So, as I said, he walked, the minute he came into the house, he looked at myself and Laura, and he said, I don't know how he stayed in this house. He said, there's so much activity, he said, already. Really? So, he went around the house, and he was feeling spirits, and he to be honest, what he said to us, he said, it's like Victoria Station on a Monday morning. Oh my God. So, as he was doing, as he was doing his walk, in a bit, we were all in the kitchen when he set up his altar and stuff. And we've um, a very heavy chandelier on the sitting room. Yeah. And it was swinging from side to side. And I mean, it was force, like it wasn't yeah. small. Like, were you afraid, like, Richie, were you? Terrified. Yeah. Terrified. I wouldn't like, blame you. Like, myself and Laura are still very, very, very hard at night to even sleep. And tell me this, did the shaman, was he able to divine or discern whether there was a presence there? Could he describe it? Yeah, well, first of all, he walked up the stairs and he walked into Kyle's room. Yeah. And the first thing he said to me and Laura is, there's a man, I'm looking at a man in the corner of Kyle's room. So the first thing, Jerry, then that came into my head was Kyle was saying about the robber. 
So I said, could you describe him to me, please, pal? So he said he was back within the 16th, 17th century. Yeah. He said he's a, a, a cloak on. His face is covered. He has a hat and a mask around his eyes, and all I can see is his eyes. So straight away, that's the robber for Kyle. That he was describing, he was seeing the robber. Sounds like him, doesn't it? Do you know? So that, that took me then completely. But as I said, Paul was doing his work. How old is Kyle, by the way? He's five. And this poor little mite has had to put up with that. Yeah, exactly, like, you know. He must have been terrified. He is. Like, sure, Laura, I'd be terrified. You'd be terrified. Exactly, like, like Laura, the six months pregnant as well, like. She's terrified. Yeah, she is terrified of it, like, do you know? And what's, like it, what, what does it, is the shame able to give you any indication as to what may have happened? Is it an old house? What may have happened there? See, what it, what it is, Jory, they come to the house off the previous owner. Yeah. Right? And they left the house idle for 18 months. So within that 18 months, there was gangs drinking in there. There was drug parties inside the house. So what the priest and I think... Well, people are putting it down to that there was either a Ouija board or a seance or something mm. to open the portal to set this off, you know. But I didn't say that to Dinjory, not a million miles away. The good shepherd was only down the road. And he was saying that the children inside, that he was picking up inside, the energies he was picking up inside our house was of kids of unmarked graves. Children who had not passed on into the next world. Exactly. Exactly. That's why he was saying, and that's why he was picking up. You know? But he done his walk anyway, and he said that it is cleansed. It is cleansed. He was able to do the job, was he? Oh, he was able to do the job, but he said... Would you trust him? I would, Jerry, to be honest now, at the start, when I heard that he was coming down, like, Jerry, yeah. I can tell I never believe in anything like this. Right. You know, I I've, I often read books. I was watched films, but I'd be like, nah, that's a lot of lonely, like. But till it happens to yourself, like, and how the terrifying for myself, Laura, and the child, like, you know, it, it's, just, it's just something that you'll never forget. You know, it, and have you tried praying, have you? But there was a few people, when they started praying in the house, like, even as I said, when the priest was saying a mass in the house, the cooker turned on during the mass. During and the, the mass. And the cupboards opened twice. And there was a bang upstairs when there was no one upstairs or in the house next door. And that was during a mass. You know? So, like, he was baffled himself, like the priest, like... And are, have you gone back in since... Since the piled on these yeah, rock, yeah, no, not yet. When are you thinking of going back in? Well, we're thinking either tomorrow or Wednesday now to have a look, like you know. Would you do it on air? Uh, I suppose I would, like. Yeah, we might need somebody with you. Yeah. Who'd, yeah. Be, who'd go with you? Don't you doing this by yourself? Oh, I, I, I tell you, Jolly, I wouldn't go on my own. That's one thing for sure, Hinnabel. Okay, would the would the shaman go in? Would he? I'd say he would. Yeah, if you if you got in contact with him, like I can actually give you his contact number if you like. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, Sinead, I'm just thinking maybe we could do this on air tomorrow. We could we could go into the house tomorrow on air. I think that's the best thing to do. That way you'll have some company. Yeah, exactly. Because Jolly, to be honest, like I wouldn't go in there. Oh no, 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 and I wouldn't be asking you to do that. We're yeah. going to we're we're. We're, we're going to, uh, we're, we're going to, uh, Shane, we're going to go in to the house tomorrow on air for the first time, I think, since it's been, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I've been handed, in fact, it's an invocation here. I'll just read it out to you. You might say this tonight. You just repeat it, okay? Yeah. Begone, Beelzebub, Balthazar, Beetlejuice, begone, begone. Dave Sherry, our man upstairs, is going to go down and join you, okay? Yeah. One of our researchers, he's a, he's a good lad, good lad, an, an innocent sort of fellow now, so he'd, you know, he'd be clean of spirit and, and heart. Just right. the kind of guy we need for this job. And actually a rugby player, so he's, 
he's not, you know, he won't be put off by this, I can tell you. Yeah. Okay, yeah. we're going to do this. What time tomorrow? What time would be a good time to do it, do you think? See, Joey, at the moment, no, we'll see. We have to get on to the council now because they have the house. What about after 10 o'clock? Would we be up for that? <coughs> oh, I'll be after 10 anyway, yeah. Yeah, would that be all right with you? Yeah, yeah. That's okay, no you stay on the line. Okay, yep. and we're going to put you in touch with Dave Sherry. Dave's going to go down. He might have to bring some equipment with him. Um, and we will we will go in there tomorrow for the first time live on air, okay? Yeah. Be yep. gone, Beelzebub, Balthazar, and Beetlejuice. Be gone, be gone, be gone. Can you remember that? Uh, no. Okay, we'll do it. I'll do it with you. Hold on. You ready? Yeah. Be gone, Beelzebub. Begun, Bielbebub. Balthazar. Balthazar. And Beetlejuice. And Beetlejuice. Begone, begone, begone. Begone, begone, begone. Okay, right. Right, if you're up first, I'm up first, okay? Yeah. Good man, no keep the head and we'll do it tomorrow. Take care. Cheers, Joe. Bye. Right, bye. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. Jerry Ryan on 2FM. Um, Serana, good morning. Hi, Jerry. How are you? Very good. You were listening to Richie Hewitt, who told us the story of the poltergeist in his Cork home, terrifying his five-year-old child and his partner. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I, I actually I only heard the end of it today. Um, Plates I, flying out of the uh, out of the dresser, child yeah. being flung across the room. He's seeing a man he describes as a frightening robber. Um, lights going on and off. The, the 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 priest comes into the house and the cooker switching on and off. Knives and forks flying out of the drawers. You name it. This is good old fashioned poltergeist activity. Yeah, I have to say, I had um, a similar experience, but um, not as terrifying now as, as all that. But um, uh, about a couple of years ago, when I first moved out of my parents' home, I moved into a rented house nearby. Uh, first time ever going out on my own um, with my son and my boyfriend. And we only stayed there a year and a half. But while we were there, um, lots of things kind of was going on. Um, first things first were one evening we were all sitting down kind of uh, late evening uh, we hadn't turned on the lights yet I had three candles over my television when we noticed one of them was burning and uh, I remember saying to my um, boyfriend um, why did you light one candle and not the three of them what's the point in only having one lit and he said what are you on about I didn't light any candles so we uh, puzzled we were staring at it for I'd say five minutes before it actually quenched itself um, so that was the first thing I remember I asked my landlord, I said, well, is there anything strange ever going on in this house? Because, um, for, for some reason, our candle lit and it wasn't like it, you know, we hadn't lit it earlier that day and it just kind of reignited. It wouldn't have been lit for 24 hours previously. She said, no, no, nothing ever happened. Um, the house is fine. No one has ever had any complaints. Sure. I used to have, um, nightmares. I had one really, really bad nightmare where, um, in my nightmare, I couldn't talk. I would see the people in my house, and I couldn't talk to them. I couldn't, sh I couldn't shout at them, and I was trying to, but I was physically in the bed. Um, my boyfriend said to me, trying, making this crazy croaking noise, trying to speak, and couldn't. Um, this is your boyfriend making the croaking noise? No, no, that was me. It was you? <laughs> that was me. Yeah, yeah, oh I God. was the one. Yeah, he, I, I, I think I remember when I woke up of it. Out of it, I, I, I was so frightened, I, I, I said it to, I woke him up, he said, I know I've been hearing you, you've been trying to speak, making these funny noises there for ages, and it was, it was scary, yeah, um, but the worst thing that happened, which the, the most important thing, why we actually moved out, was my son, he was two and a half, uh, one night, my sister used to stay with us a lot, they used to, she used to come stay with me at weekends and things, and uh, I came home from work one evening, and um, she was staying with me, and they used to play in the bedroom, the bedrooms used to be in the attic, um, she used to play with my son, and I remember I was standing at the bottom of the stairs, I heard him say, um, look Stacey, look, there's a lady following us around, there's a lady following us around. And um, I, I heard it, and she uh, she uh, she obviously didn't pay any heed to it. But when I went upstairs, I said, "What are you? Why, where's this lady that you're talking about?" And she he said, "She's gone into your room, mummy." So I brought him into my room, and I said, "What are you on about? There's nobody in here." 
And he said, she's sitting on the bed, Mom, she's sitting on the bed. So I sat down on the bed where he said she was sitting. And I said to him, uh, look, I put my ha- wave my hand through the space where he said she was. And I said, look, there's nobody here. And he um, blocked his ears and ran to me and started to cry and said, I, I, I don't like her, Mom. She's talking to me. I don't like her. So um, immediately when he started crying, I brought him downstairs. Now, he he was two and a half. He wasn't able to tell lies. He hadn't got to that stage. He wasn't able, he, you know, there was no making things up and things like that. But uh, I brought him downstairs and he sat at the table and um, I played, I, I, I tried to be as normal as I could. And I said, what did she say to you? So he, there was a belt actually on my table and he put it around, his, wrapped it around his head. And he said, she, she looked like this mom. And he put the belt over his head like as if a shawl or a scarf. And I said, and what did she say? And he said, she said, um, when I said, I don't like you, she responded to him, I don't like you either. And um, that's when we ran downstairs and I had taken him away from the situation. But I sat awake all that night. I didn't tell anybody. I didn't say it to anyone because I had said, I'd spoken previously to my family about candles and my dreams and things going missing and stuff like that. But I didn't say anything that night about it. And... Um, the next day, I said it to my other sister, who would be really, really open to things like this. I said, "What would you? How would you feel about it? What, what would you think?" She said, "God, that's terrifying." She said, "I believe him. I believe him straight away. You know, he he doesn't tell lies. He cried. He he he, he was terrified." And um, she went home and told it to my dad. And that night, when my children, I was afraid. I had a baby at this time. I had just had my um, second son at this time. I was afraid to put them up bed that night so I let them fall asleep on the couch and I don't uh, blame you I, I still didn't tell I didn't tell my boyfriend at this stage about it but I wouldn't let them go up to the bedroom and I let them fall asleep on the couch it was a Saturday or a Sunday or something like that so it was one of the late nights anyways it didn't matter but I, my dad actually came, my, once my sister told my dad he came over and knocked on the door he said you can't sleep here and he said too much has gone on now and the fact the one thing alone is that Keith was able to tell me that, that she had told him she didn't like him and that was enough for us to yeah get up and leave so that was the last time we stayed there but uh, yeah it was what did you think it was I don't know um, but did you I, discover anything from you know no, no the uh, landlord my, or anything about no, the, the history of the house uh, no my landlord my landlord's response was please don't tell anybody about this because she would have problem renting the house please don't tell anybody of this I will have to go back to Transylvania yeah something like <laughs> so I actually, what did I you to, honestly what did you think it was what did I think it was because you know um, listening to you and listening to our pal down in Cork it's very easy to be cynical about it and kind of enjoy the conversation yeah, and enjoy yeah. the thing as a kind of a mad story but it, over the years I've heard time and time again people like you particularly somebody like you mm. who you don't mm. sound mad you don't sound deranged you don't sound delusional I know, yeah. So, you know, I kind of have to believe what you're saying. Yeah, well, that's it. Like, I didn't see it, but I know I, I was sitting beside it because, and I and I know by my son's face. When he, he saw it. To, when, that he saw it. He was terrified. He started to cry. He, there was a reason that he was crying. Yeah. You know, so I, I have to trust him that that he did see it. And but you got so, no joy from the landlord in terms of whether anything had ever happened there. No. No, nothing. no imprint of a previous anomaly or awful event. No, no, nothing. Oh, I, um, I actually, I'm just after remembering something else. So I'll tell you that in a minute. Okay. But um, no, she didn't. I, I, she didn't. She told me nothing. She told me the house beside my house had gone on fire once, but nobody had been hurt. Nobody had, nothing had happened. Um, the house that I was living in had been rented for years, so. Hmm. It, it wasn't a family home which belonged to anybody or anything like that. But I, I was the sister that I told you I was op- that I, I told about it. The first person I spoke to about it that I said was open to things. She actually had a, had an experience in my house. That's why I was so open to, to telling her. She um, one night she had been babysitting. Um, she used to sleep in my spare room, and um, she thought we had come home. She heard walking up the stairs and things like that, and she was wondering. We were very loud, obviously. She thought we had come home when we were stomping around in the bedroom and things like that. Yeah. And she, when she sat up in the bed, she realized there was a man standing at the end of her bed. And he was kind of hovering. There's two beds in the room. He was hovering over the bed backwards and forwards, and she was looking at him thinking, God, who did they bring home now and let into my bedroom, you know, to sleep in the spare bed beside me? 
and it wasn't she he was there for so long she was thinking why isn't he just going to get into bed or, or something like um she it wasn't until she picked up their fo- her phone and flashed the light at the phone to see who it was that's when he disappeared so um she had, I forgot about that yeah she had said that to me that's why and, I uh, she she was happy to have a stranger get into the bed beside her. No, no, no. There was two beds. She presumed it was it was my boyfriend's brother that, that we'd right. been out with him, and there was a spare bed. It was our spare room. There was two beds. So she but then she must have been planking herself. Then, pardon? She must have been planking herself, terrified, yes. afraid. She, oh, she was. She went in. Fearsome she, she went, for her she, safety. She left, oh, she did. She got out of the bed and went into my room where my son was asleep and, and got into bed with him because she was afraid then to sleep in the room on her own. She was she was full sure that we were home when she was she, the noise she was listening to and then there was somebody in the room that she thought... And have you ever been back there, Sarana? The only time I went back was to get my stuff and move out. I, the, the last night I slept there was the night that my, my son had seen that lady and I didn't sleep. I sat up looking mm. at him all night long. Uh, the only time I went back was to move out to pack her stuff. I wouldn't go there at night time. I wouldn't do anything like that. Um, uh, but I drive by there. Like it's, 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 I, I haven't moved too far. I drive by there every day, and I, I'm always curious to look yeah. in the windows and see how people are getting on. And is there somebody in there now? There is, definitely, yeah. yeah <laughs> there's people in there now, yeah. They'll be yeah. next up now. Um, by the way, what an interesting name you have. Oh, thanks. <laughs> where, where is it? Sirana. Sirana, yeah. Is it um, Syrian or... Egyptian, oh, or it's, I think it's just made up to be honest. Um, my mum, uh, the den, remember the den years ago? My mum, they, they used to do the birthdays on yeah. it, and um, there was some say Sarana, so she just it was with an S originally, but too many people called me Sarah Ann, so she just changed it to the so it's C E R A N N A. Yeah, I like it. Thank you very much. Okay, take care, Sarana. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Well, she sounds sane, doesn't she? Um, here's a couple of texts uh, going back to um, uh, John um, uh, and his extraordinary story. He was so candid, I think, and frank and honest. He seems to have uh, affected quite a few of you with his story about he and his wife. Um, hi, Jerry. That man was so honest. It's lovely to hear a man speak so frankly. I'm so sad for him and his wife, says Fidelma. I'm married... I'm a married man, says another texter, 51552, in my early 40s. I've been married now for 17 years, but our sex life is virtually non-existent and has been for many years. I don't know where to turn to next. I love my wife dearly, but I can't do this anymore. And I think that text perfectly sums up what a a barrier sex can be. Sex can be for those of you who are having full sex lives and enjoying full sex lives. Um, sex is, you know, whatever. What did Bono describe in that great song? God's glue. It's a fantastic description. But when it's not there, the lack of it can be incredibly frustrating and damaging and a source of acrimony between otherwise incredibly close people. It can turn people who are hugely powerfully in love and very close and normally understanding of one another's foibles into almost mortal enemies. So don't underestimate what the lack of it can do. Um, As a menopausal female, here's another on 51552, as a menopausal female with no interest in sex, I believe this man should self-masturbate as a first choice. But if his need is to have the involvement of another person, then massage parlours are probably a suitable alternative. But in consideration for his wife, he should choose one out of the area. A very practical listener there, I think you'll agree.